has been a star of this season tonight. He showed the world what he can do. My God, a break. An extra gear for the freshman. Touchdown. And the freshman is off. Foot race. <laughs> They're looking at shoe bottoms and nothing else. Into the end zone. Touchdown. The freshman just ran it back to Philadelphia. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Future Freshman Podcast. Welcome to Episode 7. Uh, of course, I'm your host, Brandon T. Sanders. You can find me at Twitter, at CFF University. Um, I have a very special guest tonight. Of course, he is the head of the Debbie Department here and an analyst over at CampusToKitten.com. He also contributes to the Debbie Dashboard, and he is a fellow musician. So we're going to create a band just for C2C purposes alone. <laughs> and it's my friend, Coy Pereira. And, of course, you can find him at Twitter, at FF underscore guitarist which i'm very envious of so Corey, welcome to the show buddy thanks brandon man i appreciate being here appreciate uh, you bringing me on you know i'm really pumped to be uh, a part of the campus canton team uh i love all the content everybody is putting out you know i really feel like this thing is kind of headed for some big things i i know we're in the early stages but 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 campus can could really be kind of like a pioneer in this industry when all is said and done um you know the team just finished putting together the freshman supplemental guide um we're working behind the scenes on the Devi guide. I believe there's a CFF one coming out as well, too. So, yep. you know, everybody's hungry. Everybody's smart. Everybody knows what they're talking about. Everybody's handsome. So, you know, I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I, I appreciate you bringing me on. I know we kind of connected over our uh, our musical past and our love for for some new age metal, which is absolutely awesome. Yes, absolutely. You know, it, it's nice to meet another metalhead in the industry because, you know, and not just those guys who like kind of listen to like Metallica and Slipknot and they're like, I'm a metalhead. It's like, no, you know, the guys <laughs> who are kind of dig- we're digging deep and we're going into the crazier, a little bit darker stuff. So, so yeah. I really like that. And I'm, I'm pumped to get into some of these freshmen. I mean, I know as a Devi guy, we kind of look at it from, from a different perspective with, with overall skill set and, and how they could translate to the NFL. Um, you know, which typically means things kind of like ignoring guys who are not in power five conferences, uh, ignoring running backs who are less than 190 pounds, right, you know, looking right. for guys with, with translatable athleticism, um, not really always worried about mega production, but of course you still like to see it. So I, I think it's going to be kind of fun today to kind of look at it from, from two different angles here. Yep. Uh, it's a mashing of two worlds, which I think is fantastic to have that. Good thing is Corey here has played some CFF. He's still fairly new to it, but he has mm-hmm. played. So for all the listeners, we still get a little bit of CFF mixed in, but we still get a Devi perspective as well as a CFF perspective as well. Uh, of course, like Corey says, that we both, a fun fact, and you can DM us later, if, but we all come from uh, bands that you can now hear on Spotify, YouTube, things like that. And we made a good run out of it, but now here we are with our our love of football and, and contributing to uh, new new horizons, man. Like C- C2C is growing. We're breaking new molds and, you know, just kind of getting the content out there. So like you said, like we're we're definitely on a new frontier and I'm really excited to what, you know, us as a team can do. And eventually we'll be able to expand and make it even bigger and better. So I'm very much looking forward to it. All right, Corey, let's knock out some housekeeping real quick. Of course, I need to thank my guy, Sick Edits HD. Of course, that's with a Z. He does the video part of the intro for the Future Freshman Podcast. So if you've seen that already, I uh, hope you guys are enjoying it. I think it's a sick hype video as well. Uh, of course, you can find him on YouTube. So go check him out as well. If you love anything as far as highlights, uh, just you know, videos of NCAA, he's your guy. Go check him out as well. Just like Corey was saying, we do have the Freshman and Supplemental Guide that's out currently at the moment. Um, you can get it for a $20 subscription. Of course, if you go to the NIL subscriber, I think the grandfathering period is now over. But if you do go, uh, I believe it's, you know, if you do the NIL, you're guaranteed everything regardless, right? So uh, you should be able to get that. The Debbie Guide's coming. We'll let Corey talk about that here in just a minute. And a CFF Guide. Uh, so for $80, that's a value within itself because you're getting all the guides and you're getting all the tools that we have, ADP, um, measuring tools, things like that, that uh, Jarek and a few of the other guys have come up with that I think is fantastic. And I think it's breaking ground. So we're definitely making leeway there for sure. So Corey, from a, a Devi perspective, how's the guy coming along and what could people expect in that, uh, you know, kind of coming up here pretty shortly? Yeah, it, it's coming along quite well. We're hoping to to kind of hit a, an early June date to hopefully get you guys ready for all those drafts, um, uh, get it ready in time for all those drafts. Um, we're looking at about 200, 200, uh, 200 and up profiles anyways we're going to write a lot and then we're going to wind it all down and kind of find out find a, a, our nice ranking list there for us but um yeah all the guys are going really hard um it's good you know compared to the the future the um the freshman supplemental drive or the, or the cff one where you guys are going to kind of be focusing more on some production that's going to come and stuff like that um this one's going to just be kind of focused on nfl transition and what and what we kind of see 
um, how these guys translate to the NFL. You know, you can expect things like seeing what kind of round projection we might even might even uh, think of these guys and and um, uh, if they're going to be good this year, if they're going to be bad this year, if you, if you have the early if you have the early production, if you don't have a late production, um, we have the advanced uh, metrics as well in there. Um, so you're going to have all the advanced uh, statistics right in front of your face. We do hit on, on some of the freshmen. We probably won't go as deep as, as, uh, as the freshman guide because, you know, there's lots to still be figured out when it comes to figuring out NFL transition. We've got to kind of see how these guys do in their first or second years. You know, you know, you've seen it. I'm sure we've all seen it where these freshmen kind of fade away, uh, faster than, than we thought, or, you know, a guy like Justin short or who we have no idea what to even do with right, right now or something. Yeah, so, not at all. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, we're grinding away at it. We're still going to, we still got a a lot of work to do, but um, it's coming together really nicely. Absolutely. So something to look forward to, of course, look for out in June, Uh, last bit of housekeeping news, and then we'll come up with uh, news that broke here and it has something to do with the freshman. We'll do that right before we jump to segment one, but uh, I do want you to guys go check out prize picks national champions tonight. Of course, my Tar Heels play Kansas. It's weird if you're a Roy Williams fan in general, but hey, it is what it is. So, uh, but with Price Picks, you can do all kinds of sports, tons of prop bets. So it's a good way to get your bankroll up, get ready for the football season because that's where we're going to make our money. Of course, that's where the CFFU podcast, the other podcast that I host, where we just do Price Picks, we do DFS, and we just do Players of the Week for CFF. So if you're really looking forward to something to where you have some decent money that we can use to then double up or triple up here as the season starts. This is the way to do it with prize picks. So use the code CFFU, get a 100% matching deposit up to $100. So please go check that out if you can as well. Of course, it's here on the uh, the bottom. So go check that out, guys, as well. All right, before we move on to segment one, uh, Corey, you said something on Twitter and it made you know uh, made the news, but Adam Randall has sustained injury. Uh, of course, he's the freshman that us at Campus Camp were super high on. And uh, we really liked him even more so than Antonio Williams. Not nothing against Antonio Williams. He's a fantastic receiver. But Adam Randall had the that type of figure that Clemson looks for when it comes to like the big guys like your your DeAndre Hopkins or the Mike Williams and guys like that have transcended over to the NFL. Uh, so what's your thoughts on this as far as Adam, Rand- Adam Randall, as far as, pro- you know, like non production, because we, we see it's going to probably be long term. But what do you think as far as from a Debbie side, as well as, you know, what we could see at fantasy? Uh, does this hold him back? Uh, do you still think he's still able to pick up the playbook as he's healing and you know, kind of just pick up where he left off? What's your thoughts about the injury, man? Yeah, I mean, I hope so. I hope that he can kind of sit back and really dive into the playbook and learn a lot about it. But I mean, yeah, I dove into him recently. I actually wrote his profile for the Debbie guy that's going to come up. Awesome. So uh, I'm actually very, very, I was very high on him. And I, I'm not going to say was because I probably still am. Um, I mean, I know that we're not going to see as much CFF production as we may have, might've liked. And the spring, right. the buzz was good in, in spring, right? Yeah, I mean, we were excited he, for him other than Bo yeah. Collins. He was the guy we were looking at for sure. Yeah, but he now was pushing for Antonio some Williams starting. by default. Yeah. So. So yeah, he was pushing for some starting time. So, so I was definitely excited about that. He was actually coming in as my wide receiver two in this class, in the Devi side as well. Wow, I mean, nice. talking about a guy with 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 size, athleticism. I loved his versatility, a guy who took wildcat snaps to um shows a lot of that open field ability as well. Uh had the ability to be press, was running a, a, a lot of different routes in the route tree as well. So I loved all the moldable tools that he has. Yeah. And, and I still hope that he, that he still is gonna have those. I mean. Uh, I, we're seeing new technology with ACLs and stuff like that. He's still right. hoping that he can get on the field later in the season. So if he does yeah. that, then 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 I have a, a little more hope for him not to be a complete zero in year one. I know Austin has that uh, has that uh, zero wide receiver one theory where uh, I don't know how that I don't know how, how it kind of works with injury and stuff like that. I don't know if he's right. going to get an excuse because of it or not. Maybe. But, uh, yeah, He'll I'm slide not, to Antonio Williams by default, like we were saying. Yeah, yeah. I know exactly. he was a Randall guy too, and so was um. You know, Matt, uh, big wide receiver guy. He loved Adam Randall as well. Uh, yeah, but I, I, you know, if he could get back, here's the thing: like when it comes to CFF, even if he's in playoff, you know, contention, if somehow Clemson finds the way into the playoff, by that time it's over for CFF. Yeah. Literally, we only have 12 weeks, and when it comes time to do bowl games, like for us, that's just DFS play. That's not actual like winning your season league and type of that. So we're kind of scratching Randall as a uh, wait and see type situation, but we are hoping that. Because of this, Williams can now come in and kind of, you know, get that thing to there. And so then we'll see a true battle between Williams and Randall. And we just hope that Randall doesn't lose a step and that he's still the same guy that we that we loved coming out of high school. So, right. yep. um, so are you ready to move on to segment one? Good, sir. Let's do it. Awesome. 
All right. So there's been some chatter on Twitter, and we'll, you know, some of these guys that have been talking are the ones that have done the guide for these guys. And that is the discussion of Jamarion Miller versus Emmanuel Henderson, who is the person that's going to take over once Gibbs and McKellen decide to leave Alabama, and who's going to roll with the tide, right? So we're going to start with Jamari Mira because this is a guy that you really loved on there as well. Mm -hmm. So yep. I want to get your take first, but we'll start with he is a high four-star recruit. 24-7 um, sports grade has him at 0 0.9629, which we learned on the official is the composite. So it's not just 24-7, but rivals and shooting will be on three. So it's a composite of all of them together at a certain average of ranking of course 24 7 has a higher leverage on their rankings on there to go along with it however now we know how this composite happened so now i'm a little bit more comfortable of bringing this to the table to make it sense for our, for the listeners and viewers for sure so he is 510 he's 195 pounds i believe he's probably bigger than that at this point because it's alabama they just feed the guys and they lift and they just go to town basically this this is an rbu basically alabama just rolls with the next one rolls with the next one rolls with the next one so um, of course, Felix did some write-up here on the actual uh, profile of Jamari Miller, and he said that he's efficient, decisive, and a mature rusher with a legitimate three-down ability and demonstrated it by his uh, 73 career receptions, which means he's going to probably stay on the field if he gets the shot to do it. Uh, he shows poise and patience, and he's allowing uh, the blockers to create space. So he's not one of those guys that does the pitter-patter on the feet, gets anxious, and decides to run to a hole that has nothing to offer. Miller is patient and looks for the best option before he plants and goes, basically. Um, he, yeah, so with the, his 10.71, dash time, not many are catching Miller from behind. So once he gets into the second plane and he's off and running, good luck trying to catch the man. He's like a bowling ball. It's just hard to stop him once you get momentum right. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's been used creatively in high school. So right now, uh, you know, when uh, Felix did the write-up, he's got him as a uh, late day two or early day three NFL draft pick, which I can definitely see that. Uh, with these guys doing more like the running back by committee type situation, you're getting a lot of more fresh legs. And I know we have a case where people look down on that in CFF or in college, especially a guy like Zach Evans, who's told people because he's going pro, he wants to have less running. So, hence why you see Ulysses Bentley move from SMU over to Ole Miss, right? So that's not nice when it comes to CFF, but when it comes to an overall NFL evaluation, Zach Evans has more tread on his tires. Another guy we could look at is a guy like Alvin Kamara, who was in Tennessee, and he was kind of like the RB2, right? So when I was with the fantasy footballers at a write-up, and the biggest thing that stood out to me is that they kept saying, especially the scouts, he had a lot of the tread on the tires. He's fast. He really didn't get worn down a lot in college. And then as soon as he got that opportunity, you know, in Peyton's offense there in the New Orleans Saints, he did the thing, right? So right. as long as as long as Tamar can stay out of trouble, he's he's still, you know, one of those high assets to have in uh NFL fantasy, right? So mm -hmm. here's here's another guy we're looking at, Jamari Miller. And we'll talk about Emmanuel, Emmanuel Henderson first, but What's your thoughts on Miller and what did you see in your evaluation and stuff like that between, you know, and what, what's your thoughts on him flipping from Georgia to Alabama? It seems like Georgia's had plenty of options and now, you know, they got Andrew Paul, but they lost two in the process with James and Miller. So what's your thoughts, man? Yeah, no, I mean, I, um, I really do like Miller quite a bit. Um, he's actually coming in as a top five back for me. I'm probably not as, as super deep. I have a, I have a pretty good feel of about 15 to 20, 20 backs right now in this class. And he's coming in as a top five back for me because, you know, we're looking at the size. He's coming in at a great size um, and he's only going to grow there in Alabama. So that's, so that's awesome. Um, you love the stellar high school career over 5,500 yards, uh, over 60 touchdowns. Um, and I agree with a lot of what Felix said here. I mean, you look at the utilization that he had, the versatility with the over 70 receptions uh, in his high school career. It wasn't just always out flats. It wasn't just always screens. It, this guy was utilized down the field. He was stretched out wide. Wide. So you love to see that that versatility, and and I saw a lot of the same things. You know, it's, it's quick feet, um, excellent vision between the tackles, um, good burst off the line. It's, he doesn't lose much momentum, changing direction. But I, I, I agree with a lot of what he said that that he's not going to be that much of a dancer. He's not. Oh, he's not the kind of back that's going to string together multiple moves in the open field. You know, he's he's a he's really a, he's a lethal one cut runner, one or two cuts, hits the hole, heads downhill can break through arm tackles, can break through ankle tackles. So um, I really love his makeup coming in. I think he has a lot of versatility. Um, and of course, joining Bama, who has an absolutely shining resume, uh, as you said, putting running backs in the NFL. Um, I think, you know, I, I was looking at over, over the past 10 years with, with Alabama and uh, 
every running back that's gotten drafted, we're, we're looking at an average of 2.4 round draft capital. So, I mean, and then that even includes a seventh round selection of, of um, uh, Bo Scarborough. So, I right. mean, we're, these guys are all coming in. They're all transitioning to the NFL, even if some of them are less than others or are more than others. But they're all getting looked at. Even you look at a guy who like Josh Jacobs, who didn't get much much play time yeah. or anything like that. And he's a starting NFL running back right now, you know. So, mm -hmm. so I think there's a lot of hope when you come to, to Alabama. And I do give them a little bit of a bump when they go to a place like this or a place like Georgia, who is kind of like running back university, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, Bama did have uh, the second lowest rush rate in the SEC. Um, but we all know how potent their offense is. It, it, it's a lot of yeah, efficiency. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of efficiency that comes out of there. Um, I mean, if you're trying to look at his role this year too, I mean, we all know Gibbs transferred in from from Georgia Tech. And yeah. I mean, not much has to be said. He's awesome. The reviews have already been glowing coming out of camp. Um, I do wonder if maybe they'll use him more in a multifaceted role, or maybe they split him out or use him more in passing and and get and take uh, advantage of his strengths in the in the receiving game and could maybe leave a few more carries for other guys i mean they have they didn't split too much they had a lot they had a lot of injuries though as well last year so um yeah. uh, brian robinson ended up getting a lot of the work there but they have in the past they did kind of split a lot of the carries and and stuff like that so um i mean you've got roy dell and jace coming off injuries i'm not sure how much they're going to be able to do coming right in i think the latest update on them if i'm correct was I don't even know. I think I think there's there's still a ways out. Roy Dell might be even further out by the sounds of it. Um, yeah. So yeah. it still remains to be seen what happens there. I do like McClellan quite a bit. Um, I do too. I, yeah, I know some guys are a little bit lower on him. This was a guy who I think no. had um, even one of the highest receiving grades in P on PFF for, run for running backs, and he only played like I can't remember what it was ten games, seven games, or or ten yeah. games or something. But yeah, he's he's a guy that I really like. Had really high spark score uh, as a, as a recruit um, really athletic, big. So, so uh, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it breaks down with him. Um, so, so seeing a year one role for a guy like Jamarian Miller is probably tough. There's a lot of guys there. You still have Trey Sanders as well. You have listed here. I almost forgot yeah. about him. Former freaking number one running back recruit or, or top three. I can't really remember. Yeah. Going through a bunch of injuries and keeps working his way back. His, his story isn't isn't very unsimilar like Z Zamir White, right? Who's a guy who, yeah. Yeah, who had a bunch serious. of injuries, had to had to kind of work his way back. And look what he did. Look at what he's done for his stock now in his final year. So Trey Sanders can even be looking as a, at, at another big stock bump or another a lot of usage too. So it's tough to see a big role for Jamari and Miller out the gate. Yeah. Uh, I'll go ahead and say, we'll, we'll talk some CFF here and then we'll kind of transition back into the, to the Debbie. So Jameer Gibbs was coming in, right? He was originally going to do Alabama, but he's like, Hey, I want playing time. Immediately he went to Georgia tech. Well, Georgia tech ain't really putting much out there. Jeff Sims is barely going to start. Uh, Zach Gibson from Akron is high on his, you know, on his tail as far as possibly surpassing him. So Gibbs wanted to go back where Nick Saban knows that he can use him. So if we're looking at CFF this year, this is the Gibbs train right now, right? Mm -hmm. And I honestly do not blame Jason McKellen for staying because Alabama does like to use as much eligibility as possible out of their backs to do it as well. So Jameer's going to come in here, be an absolute beast, and then he's probably going to the NFL because he's got a high, high draft stock already, right? So Jason McKellen could easily be the RB1 or RB1A probably next year, right? So that's where we run into how much of, is Jace going to get next year? Is it Roy Dell? Is Trey still going to, you know, right out his senior year, is he going to try to transfer to get as much production as he can to try to get some NFL draft stock? We're not sure, but it's a rare situation that actually, you know, other than Kamar Wheaton, that RBs really transfer out and stuff like that. It's, you know, it's a transfer portal, so it's more tempting nowadays, right? But mm -hmm. Alabama has a proven track record of holding on to guys – and they reward them like Brian Robinson Jr., right? So now he'll right, get a right. chance to be drafted, whether it's going to be, you know, seventh round, fourth round, fifth round, you know, whatever, you know, whoever can find value with him, stuff like that as like a one of those big backs, right? But Alabama running backs have that that option, you know? So Jamarian now, and we'll talk about now, of course, his freshman addition, of course, this mm -hmm. is Emmanuel Henderson, right? So, of course, he is the second overall running back, not just the – uh the, I think what was the third for Jamari Miller. So really Alabama got two and three when it comes to the RBs that are available in the 2022 class, right? So Henderson is a four-star 0 0.9810, so he ranks a tad higher. Uh, before we look into uh, what Felix wrote on Emmanuel, we'll look at some of the things that uh, Matt, that, that big wide receiver guy here did. So Jamari Miller, 21.1 miles per hour, 
7,868 newtons, which is great. We want to be above 20 miles per hour. We want to be usually above 7,000, or I say 6,000 newtons is okay. But if you can get high seven into the eights, now you're really moving with force. Um, then, of course, the counterpart, which is the other guy, Emmanuel Henderson, 21.7, and now he's at 7,909, which means I believe Miller is the bigger back. So Henderson putting mm -hmm. out as much speed to go along with the smaller – amount of uh you know mass that he has on there he's really moving down the field so henderson tends to be more i guess the burner running back between these two guys so maybe henderson might take on a gibbs type role here in the near future uh so let's take a look at henderson and we'll kind of come back and talk between miller and henderson so henderson is probably the most polarizing prospect is what felix wrote uh at any position uh having stepped away from the campus uh henderson is tall long and he's angular so he might mm -hmm. be a better athlete than running back. So he was a, initially an athlete coming out before he, you know, transitioned to running back before he was taken as a recruit, right? So he, he could be a weapon just like Jamari, and I believe he has the same type of tendencies. So um, he's pretty a sudden runner. He can make cuts on a single run. So he's very much uh, more of a stop, go, boom, and he takes off type situation. So maybe not as patient per se as Miller, but I would say mm -hmm. at least elusive. Uh, moves his hips around quite a bit. So he reminds me, uh, you know, I mean, I would say like guy that we had, like Ty Chandler was a poor man's version of like Emmanuel Henderson right. and stuff like that is being able to see, see the elusiveness, take off, use his hips, uh, break the contact and keep on going basically type situation. This is what Henderson can do as well. Um, so he is a traditional running back and runs, uh, you know, the interior type situation, not as flashy as a running back, I would say, just tried and true, true running back type situation as well. So uh, you know, he's, he's got a level high. Uh, the only thing is uh, Felix noted that he didn't have a lot of high competition in, uh, you know, uh, in his at Alabama and in the, in the state that he actually did high school. So he didn't get as much competition as, say, as a Jamarian Miller and stuff like that. So people are kind of putting that into the perspective of Henderson might be the higher prospect, but he didn't have as the high competition, even in his state, you know, championship games and stuff like that as a Jamarian Miller. So does any of that? play into your your thoughts on Miller versus Henderson or you're just like hey I've removed that and I just look at the the prospect themselves would you say I, I try to just look at the prospect itself I mean I think judging a lot off high high school film in general is is really tough you, there's right. only a certain there's only a certain few things you can really look for you know athleticism how he open field, how he's able to make adjustments, his vision, how he reads the snap off the line, what kind of offense they played in, what kind of transition are they going to come from? Was he traditional? Was he playing in a wing T offense? Was he playing in a lot of read option, running outside and stuff like that? So uh, yeah. it's more a lot about, about how, how they're going to transition and how tough I think it's going to be. But but uh, occasionally I do look at the high school level of competition and think like, okay, you know, if I'm trying to separate two prospects, like, yeah, that, that could hurt in the long run, I guess, if I'm going to compare, you know, a higher level to a lower level i mean that could be like a tiebreaker type thing for me um it's not something that's like super included in my in my process right now because i think with debbie we're looking at you know the collegiate career more so than the high school career of course we have to make decisions yeah. on these guys for our supplemental drafts and for our drafts mm -hmm. I, ever for a debbie draft usually we have drafts every year just four or five more rounds of, of taking more guys so of course we're always going to have to know about these guys and try to make a decision but but i mean right. when, when comparing these two anyways like like you said, Emmanuel Henderson is kind of kind of more athlete, um, mm. and uh, I just hate his frame, man. I mean, it's six yeah. six one, 185. It's a very lean, very wiry yeah. frame, right? Um, he did have some background playing some receiver in, in high school as well. So, so, so mm. there is some people that have even speculated: could he be a position switch? Could he be somebody who's used more as a versatile weapon, kind of like you were alluding to? Um, I do think Henderson is a little more dynamic in the open field. I know we talked about Jamari and how he was patient, um, waited for his hole to open up, hits his hole, and uh, and just accelerates through it. But I did find Henderson a little bit more diverse, a little more dynamic, um, yeah. be able to to cut, uh, string multiple moves together, not really uh, lose a lot of momentum while he's doing that. You know, very bursty. Um, I'm surprised to see the miles per hour, to be honest. And I haven't brought it yeah. up with you pre-show because I do think that when I was looking on tape, I, I found that Jamarian might have more of a finishing gear than Henderson mm -hmm. does. I think I think Henderson is a quicker and shorter space. He has that bursty twitch to him, but I, d I did think that Jamarian might have that more pull away speed, whereas like I didn't see Emmanuel pulling away as much as I maybe would have wanted to. But um, 
Yeah. You know, when it does come to these two backs, though, too, I do have Miller higher right now. Uh, Henderson, I'm worried about the frame. I'm worried about their old. I, I do remember, maybe you can help me out on this, too, if because I know you mm-hmm. kind of follow along with these spring news. I did hear something about Henderson maybe might be getting closer to 200. I think it was might have been at the All-American game, something yeah. like that. So I am looking out for that. If he comes in and weighs in a lot higher, there's, there's a chance that I could raise him up because weight is a big factor mm-hmm. for me, especially at this stage. I mean, uh, I know a lot of guys have done studies. We're looking at about 12 to 14. 14 pounds on average that, th- that these recruits kind of gain over their times in college. So I'm not projecting anything above that. And at 185, he's looking at me being 200 and at six, one, that's, that's still really lean. So if he's already coming in at 200 to Alabama, getting in that weight room there, then I have a lot of hope for him to maybe be a little bit more and maybe grow a little bit more as well. Yeah. But, at, but for right now, I'm, I'm on Jamari on as the guy. Um, I think he's a really well-rounded back. Uh, I think he can do a lot of things re- really well. Um, I kind of compared it to, I think he can be kind of like, if he gets his opportunity, I think he can kind of be like the Damian Harris of this, of this backfield, a guy who really yeah. did everything really well for Alabama and was using all over the field and in multiple ways. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So let's, let's look at um, value. So we'll, we'll start with Debbie first and we'll go into CFF. So Debbie, uh, you know, two Bama running back. So I'm sure the value has got to be fairly high in a Debbie draft. What, what would be the, uh, kind of the strategy that you take? Of course, it does look, you know, everything's about team structure. So, I mean, I know people are like heavier on RB. Some have their stud wide receivers. Some, if you're doing super flex, are big on QBs coming out and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But let's remove all that. Let's say it's just a normal, every, every you know, wide receiver, running back, quarterback, all of it as far as roster is kind of the same number of players already in the NFL. So when you're looking in the Debbie, what's, what's your thoughts as far as taking these guys of the rounds and kind of a strategy you would kind of go with, would you say? So yeah, I am going to target Miller. I think I have enough skepticism about Henderson that I might wait. And uh, the market is kind of changing. I think that that's kind of becoming the norm. And, and a lot of people call it the C2C bum. Um, yes, and I think that's kind of what's happening. I think that's kind of what's happening here with how much we're talking about it. Yes, um, especially after the Twitter stuff. So yes. yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> but early on in, the, in this offseason, Emmanuel Henderson was going first in almost every draft. Yeah. So I felt like it was a great value with Jamarion Miller and I was targeting him lots. But I mean, in my most recent mock that I did of just pure pure uh pure freshman uh jamarion miller went at 2.2 but there's there was a few questionable first round picks uh, that i wouldn't okay. really agree with um but so uh, uh and then emmanuel henderson went 2.8 um okay. i could i could see more so pulling the trigger on jamarion miller more around that deeper um 110 111 112 area and maybe mm-hmm. early second if he's still hanging around there um uh, but for Emmanuel Henderson to be kind of like right on his tail or wherever I'm kind I think I'm going to be out at that price. I think I just like a lot of the other guys around that area a little bit more, you know, I'd rather take a shot on maybe like Keon Gray's, um, yes. would have been Adam Randall. Uh, um, and even, yes. I know, I know that a lot of guys are off on him for CFF because, uh, Texas A&M hasn't really had done a great job uh, developing these guys, but a guy like Chris Marshall still very high for me. Um, Evan Stewart still very high for me. So uh, I'm gonna, I'd rather be targeting guys like that other than, than taking a chance on Henderson right now, at least. So would you say, and you know, I'll, I'll phrase my my buddy Mitch Hart. He likes to z- he likes to zag when people zig. So it's like, hey, if Henderson's at a you know more of a value. Would you see more people taking Henderson at the value, hoping that he can emerge as Alabama, or would you still say the smart play is just take, you know, spinning up on Miller here at the, the second round? That's actually a good point because if Henderson continues to fall, then he's going to become a good value. And going to Alabama, I do still have hope for him. This guy's still a top ten guy for me. And we got the but transfer he, portal, so you never know. Too, exactly. Right? I mean, he's still coming in at number seven for me because I, I respect the pedigree. I respect where yeah. he's going. I respect everything like that. So I'm willing. I, I am willing to give him a chance. I mean, like I said, he felt the two hundred eight here. So if he starts hitting that third round range, then exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to be willing to pull the trigger there. There we go. Uh, and then same thing for the Randall people that are out there. I mean, if you still have high hopes on Randall, I mean, people now Williams is going to shoot up in freshman drafts. So if you can get mm-hmm. Randall now at a couple rounds later because of the injury, it's just a matter if you're willing to sit on him or not. Uh, when it comes to CFF, like there's larger dynasty rosters and stuff like that. So there's some space and there's also usually like a practice type squad. Some people do, you know, like, you know, things like that. Taxi squads like you get in MFL and things like that. It really just kind of depends on, are you willing to keep that spot and hold on and hope that a sophomore year 
or maybe they just redshirt Randall. So now I can still get four years, you know, possibly a production. So just depends if you want to do that versus taking Williams, you know, and getting, hoping to get, you know, maybe some wide receiver two production out of Clemson it really just comes down to that QB battle. It's a, you know, a whole nother story there, but uh, with Alabama, you can't go wrong with picking up at least one of their running backs. Yeah. Even if the guy that chose Trey Sanders, Trey Sanders is still on the roster and still has a chance to break out if injury occurs to one of these guys. So it's like, you know, you can't really go wrong with an Alabama running back. Now yeah. let's look at CFF Corey. So I'm, you know, I'm not. There's no production year one. There might be like no. a handoff, a third down situation. Jimmy might come off the field. You might see Henderson clean up duty, right? Uh, Miller yeah. might, you know, take up some. You know, there might be uh, punt returns, you know, kickoffs, things like that. So I mean, special teams, and that's a good thing. If freshmen can get in and do the special teams and earn their, you know, their respect for Coach Saban, that's going to go a long way into year two for sure. And that's what we've kind of seen with some of these guys if they are going and not the receiver and they can, you know, trust to hold on to the ball and get the kick return and get the punt return. They got a shot, you know what I'm saying? At least to get in there, maybe on some third downs and some blocking duty and stuff like that. Right. Um, so these guys aren't going two, three, four, you know, sometimes, I mean, it's an Alabama running back. So I could see maybe in CFF or someone's like, yeah, it's an Alabama running back. So I really just want to grab and hold on to him. So I can maybe see like a fourth round for Miller, maybe fifth or sixth for someone like Henderson, which is good value for CFF. But, uh, I mean, I don't know if I would take that. That's kind of rich, you know, for me. But what was your thoughts, you know, looking at CFF for production, knowing that you might have to sit on it a year or so, would you use one of these higher round picks or would you kind of see if there's, uh, you know, if one drops and see if there might be value or are you just looking completely the other way in CFF? Yeah, so I uh, for CFF, what I have played is season long. I'll have to admit go. that I haven't played Dynasty, so uh, the good. thought of holding on to these guys with with their limited four to five years or whatever you're hoping for that's to, that that's a little bit of a messes with my work. mind a little bit. It's hard yeah. for me to kind of de- uh, determine that. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say, I guess if I if I can relate it to C two C, I know it's CFF. We want the production. We want that. Um, Alabama has a lot of guys that do a lot as well. Um, so who knows if, if Jamarian's ever going to truly be that, that heavy workload guy. So right. I could see the apprehension in CFF, but in C2C because of the Devi upside and because of the NFL upside, he's a guy that I'm, that I'm probably willing to take a little bit higher than other guys. And because I'm a little bit higher on him, on him as well, but yeah, for production, I totally get what you're saying. And I, 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 I pretty much picture it as zero for year one. Um, yeah. and then next year we'll see where we're at. Cause I mean, a lot of these guys are eligible. I don't, you know, I don't, it depends what Trey Sanders does this year and stuff like that. I don't know if I don't think he'll, he'll, he'll go through, he'll probably stick around another year, depending on what he does. Uh, yeah. I think Roy Dell has another year. I'm not even too sure about that. Yeah. It's the year? super seniors because of COVID. So technically, yeah, guys right. have because COVID, year. yeah, COVID's going to mess with yeah. everything too. So all these guys could have another eligible year and all of them could maybe want to stay because Alabama. So I get the apprehension in CFF. Yeah. Um, you know, so for the guy, people listening or the goes that are watching, um, if you, you know, CFF is more like just hoping that you hit on one of the Alabama running backs, right. And just hope that it's the guy that takes the thing, but you have to be patient. So if you are going to take any of these guys, I would say I'd probably lean Miller still for right now more than Henderson. However, if people are zigging, maybe you should zag like Mitch says. So if Henderson is dropping, you know, eighth, ninth round, and, you know, this isn't a supplemental. I mean, why not, right? So you take a swing at one of the Alabama running backs. But, you know, all up to you guys. But we wanted to bring it to your attention. Is it Miller? Is it Henderson? Who do you like? Uh, either way, I meant I think it's just talent all around when it comes to Alabama, man. All right. You ready to move on to the next one? Let's do it. All right, man. So this one is going to be someone that's uh, actually gaining some steam in the C2C community as well. Of mm-hmm. course, we're getting some good reports from this guy, too, out of camp. And this is Justin Williams. He is a 24-7 sports grade of 0.9021. He is a four-star prospect who did commit to Tennessee. Uh, he is the 24th overall running back in the 22 class. So here's where we really like, right? Six foot, 210 pounds. Mm-hmm. We took a look at the big wide receiver analytics, 21.6 miles per hour. But here's... Mm-hmm. Here's the sweet spot, 8,476 news, which means the dude is trucking, right? So we got a little bit of a write-up here. And, of course, this is from our guy, Austin Nace. So this might have a little bit of the Austin slash C2C bump to go along with it as well because he has said <laughs> something on some of his podcasts. So the Justin Williams name is getting around. So, uh, But he 
what Austin wrote is that he's a prototypical running back. So he's got the proper size and speed, which you can see at the time of this writing, he said he was six foot and two Oh five. So he's already two ten with 24 seven. I believe he might even be up to two fifteen in Tennessee there at camp. So far. that's the so, rumor right now. Anyways, that's you know. the rumor He's two fifteen. And if you're looking at the Newtons that Matt's been able to provide, Holy cow. If you can get it close to Nick, to the Nicholas Singleton, like 9,000 Newtons, Holy moly. We're looking in for some, for some decent production. And the thing is, this is a great offense too. And we'll talk about it a little bit as well, but yeah, um, you know, he has the frame to get up to 215, 220. So he's already 215. If he pushes 220, we're looking at a dude that's going to be hard to bring down as well. So, and I think he could do it. And the, what Austin agrees with is, is losing it without much losing the athletic ability. So he still keeps that, you know, shiftiness still keeps that speed and is able as well. So he was clocked at 21 miles per hour. He's up 21.6 now, which indicates he has straight line speed to go to give defense complete trouble. So dude's going to be hard to stop, right? So mm -hmm. Williams is a well-rounded player. Uh, he won't, like also said, he won't wow you with anything in particular, but he can catch passes out of the backfield, which is great for a hypo offense because, you know, wide receivers go nuts there. I love Hendon Hooker this year. It's going to be fantastic. Now that we have the Nico news, I'm not sure about Tavon Jackson. Of course, if you listen to last podcast, the throwing motion of things of Tavon Jackson, I don't know if he's going to be the guy. I mean, he has the tangibles on the legs, but Nico, as far as prospect and stuff like that, is blowing. Mm -hmm. He's blowing everyone away. Other than Arch Manning, you can't top a Manning, I guess, right? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, with a fantasy upside here, uh, with Josh Heupel's in, uh, three more backs, that's the only thing. Like He likes to rotate his back, so we'll take a look at – uh, some of the stuff we've got going on here. Oops, we won't go into that. But we got Jabari Smalls, who's the junior. Right, he's right now. He's projected to be the RB one to at least start in the backfield, yeah. right? Unless he's beat out on summer camp. So right now, during spring camp, we're looking at Justin Williams is making progress. He's getting good reports, but Smalls is still running with the ones, and that's that really hasn't changed much, right? Um, Jalen Wright, the sophomore, which he's he's flashed at times, but he hasn't really proven like when he gets the opportunity to really carry the load. So I see Wright as more of a uh, role player type situation, whereas Smalls would be the guy that would start. I think Williams can very much surpass Jalen Wright and you can give me your thoughts here too, but it's very possible. Justin Williams runs into an RB, you know, RB two or RB one, a B, you know, type situation with Smalls. Mm -hmm. Smalls isn't that much, you know, I would say talented as a Justin Williams already coming out, you know? So uh, Smalls has a few years under his belt, so that does you know hold some weight that he does have college under his belt and has the playbook down and stuff like that. So right. that does give him a slight advantage. But I think already we're seeing Justin Williams catch up in camp, learning the playbook, breaking off tackles, and making nice runs against you know a decent Tennessee defense. I wouldn't say they're the best, right? But it's still SEC defense nonetheless. The kid's coming from high school and he's already breaking it. So I think uh, Austin's onto something here that uh, you know that he he has a high upside. Uh, it's just a matter of does he get a timeshare or can he uh, can he usurp Smalls and become the the true RB one here? If he breaks out kind of like a Henderson did at Ohio State, if he can get it in year one, now we're looking at least three years of solid production, which is great for tape. So that's great for Devi and mm -hmm. CFF. That's a dynasty dream. So uh, I'm definitely interested in Justin Williams. So what's your thoughts on him on a Devi perspective? I know uh, I don't know if you did the write up or not, but I believe. You know, you guys are pretty high on Williams this year for Debbie as well. So what, what are your thoughts on Williams and, and Tennessee offense? Yeah, I did do the write-up as well. Um, actually, all three guys we're going to talk about here, I did the write-up for. Yeah, but it's because I love them, so I wanted to talk about them. There we go. Uh, I am I am probably insanely high on Justin Williams compared to consensus. I know that I saw another guy on Twitter, I think, has him at like running back five, which might be a little bit lofty for me. But but I actually have him at number six right now, just outside my five, in front of Emmanuel Henderson. So nice. I might actually be a little bit higher on him than – than Austin is by the sounds of this write up, anyways. Um, I do think that he's pro he could has the potential at least to grow into into a day two guy. I mean, even you look at uh, what he did last year, um, over two thousand all purpose yards, uh, two hundred receiving yards out of that, uh, yep. fourteen touchdowns, uh, almost fourteen hundred as a junior. So he's got a, a story high school career, which you like to see. He's going to the SEC. I like this. I like the flip from West Virginia to Tennessee as well. Me too. Of course. Hooking up with, with Josh Hill there. Uh, we'll get more into that a little bit later. Um, speaking about him, just more as like a prospect, like and what I saw on film. At least, um, the thing that really stood out to me was I thought he moved really well for his size. I know at, at this mm -hmm. at, at the time of high school career, he's probably more around two hundred five. So we'll see right. if a lot of that transfers with with some of the extra weight. But um, I really do think he had that extra finishing gear and good burst. He wasn't a guy who lost a lot of momentum changing directions. He was he was splitting defenders. He was pulling away from defenders, which is something I really like to see. And um, 
I found him nimble really in, in tight spaces, a guy who could string together cuts, a guy who could, who, who could, who had the vision in the open field to find the open lane, get into open space, um, had enough power to kind of get through anybody. I will say that maybe I, I would have liked to see him run to a size a little bit more. He was kind yeah. of the guy, even though he, he has this size, he was kind of the guy who liked to run around you rather than through you, which is, which is fine. And, uh, and like you're saying with the Newtons of force, it was tough to get a hand on this guy. He would run yeah. and then guys were just slipping off of him and, and falling off of him and, and, and only reaching for the ankle and missing or, and he's breaking through everybody. So I, I really thought that he had a, a pretty well-rounded skill set. Um, a lot of impressive footwork, um, uh, vision really improved from senior year to, uh, in senior year from the junior year. Cause I, I like yep. to watch like multiple years, kind of get a feel for how they became, um, really natural runner. I, I really liked the way he, he adjusted, uh, in the open field. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty high on Justin Williams. You're already talking about a guy who's got the size you want to see the size speed ratio as, 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 uh, Austin, uh, uh, said in his write up here. Um, so uh, I'm really high. I'm going to an SEC, you know, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now. Uh, probably would have been smart to, to do that, but I know, I know the SEC has yeah. dominated the draft in recent years. So obviously that's what you want to do. You want to take guys who are dominating the draft and, and Josh Hupel's offense is, is, um, has been awesome over his whole career. I mean, I, I got listed here. He was seventh in points four last year, eighth in points four in 2020, fifth in points four in 2019, sixth in points four in 2018. So we're talking about a very up-tempo, explosive offense. Um, I know you're, uh, you were talking about how they like to, or I think Austin wrote it actually, that they like to use multiple backs. And it's true, you know, even going over those years, 2018, he had two backs who had over 1,000 scrimmage yards. Uh, 2019, he had uh, he only had one back over 1,000 scrimmage yards, but he had four guys with 80-plus carries. Yeah. 2020, he had four guys with 70-plus carries. 2021 he had three guys with 80 plus carries so i mean it's exactly how he kind of wrote it here he likes to, to split the ball around but i do think like you said that he has a chance to come in here and be rb2 for, for tennessee already uh, jabari small hasn't been the healthiest guy um i know he he's been good in 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 spots here and there and i don't i do think he's coming in obviously as the rb1 um i know you were talking about earlier that maybe you think that maybe even justin williams could overtake him and i would love to see that um, I, but I do think that, that Jabari is probably locked in as the one right now, unless he does something really bad to lose it or injury or whatever. But, um, Jalen Wright did get his opportunity a couple of times last year with once, once, um, Tyon Evans went down and once Jabari small was injured and he didn't impress me that much. Um, kind of strikes me as a change of pace guy, a guy who's yeah. just can be worked in uh, a flash here and there, a guy who's really complimentary, uh, more so than an early down guy. So, yeah, the, the reports have been great. He's pupils already singling him out, uh, in, uh, in a lot of the reports coming out, calling him a fierce competitor. Uh, he's looking good. He's looking big. So I really do think that he, it's possible he could push for that running back two role this year. Absolutely. So as far as Debbie is concerned, and you can talk rank or you can just can talk in general. Justin Williams, where where is he landed for you in Debbie? How far are you willing to kind of reach on a guy that could potentially become – and I forgot about Smalls having the injuries and stuff like that. So this, this could be where Justin Williams might see – the field a lot more than we expect him to and just run rampant and just kind of take over. So what's your thoughts as far as ranking for just, or for, for, for Williams? Yeah. So I'm kind of trying to feel that out right now. I guess we're, we're talking from a purely, like if I'm doing a, a, a depleted Debbie, Debbie draft where yeah. it's mostly just all, all freshmen, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm just talking about freshmen. Like, like, like I said, I have him high. So my value on him is probably somewhere within the second round range, third round range. But, um, but I don't think he's valued the same as he is to me to other people. Like if I'm looking at this draft, I, I just had that freshman mock because we were talking about it before. He went yeah. almost fourth round. So okay. so I'm I'm gonna try to feel out the market right now. I I'll, I will reach for a guy that I really like. Sometimes. But if he ends up reaching the fourth round, like the and staying around there, I'm gonna love that value, and I might tend to pick somebody up higher if I think I can get him later. But to yeah. me, he he is that late second round, early third round prospect in my opinion yeah for sure um cff wise i'd say um this is definitely a guy you want to pay attention to so this mm -hmm. is one that he there's opportunity and opportunity is key when it comes to cff and you know we say we're looking for early production and we're trying to find these guys that can you know produce in year one i think you know he could probably have you know one of those 80 plus carry type situation in year one However, he's one injury away from possibly taking over. And I think he has the talent where he can do better than just all these other backs kind of doing the role playing thing. I think Williams is 
kind of above that. I'm kind of, uh, I wouldn't say I'm like super, super high, but I would say I'm right up there with you as far as really liking Justin Williams. More so, I love the landing spot because he went to Tennessee and not West Virginia. Immediately, mm-hmm. my opinion like skyrocketed on Justin Williams for sure. And I love the fact that he's already. 210 already 215 he's just one of those guys that just looks like an nfl back man he just he yeah. just does you know what i mean like he transcends that which is also good um the thing is tennessee likes to rock and roll they like to they like to run it and gun it uh mm-hmm. there will be games where they're going to be behind so of course they play alabama uh and then there's a few other teams that they could possibly play so of course old miss things like that arkansas so with those type of games if they're playing from behind i expect hooker to then find Cedric Tillman, of course, and then find, uh, I think, Nayor left, so he went to Texas. So I believe, I forget I forget who their wide receiver to is. Sorry, it escaped uh, my mind. Hyatt's, Hyatt's been getting some love. Yeah, Hyatt's there, Hyatt. yeah. Um, I, I know Brew McCoy has been talking about a possible transfer there. I don't know if that'll uh, I am not a Brew McCoy guy. I'm not, on, I'm not on that train at all either. So I, if you're listening to this, yeah. I think we can both advise you to not even worry about that. Brew McCoy, it's just look for him in the USFL. That's, that's yeah. just me being a, that's me a bull, bull. So yeah, yeah, CFL, XFL, whatever, right? Um, but I would think I would take uh, – I think sometimes some the C2C drafts and the Debbie can line up with CFF, uh, mm-hmm. especially if you're just doing freshman now. If you're doing supplemental, there's guys um, you know, there's that's out there that's on your waivers. Not a high percentage, but there's guys now that have somehow found their way out onto the waivers or someone dropped in kind of like last minute to try to win, you know, championship type stuff that you can get. Uh names like an Allie Jennings, Ryan Jones from ECU. There's a bunch of guys that are out there that are juniors and seniors that you can get some supplemental stuff out. Of course, everyone's going to go 100 miles an hour at Cameron Ward, who transferred into Washington State from, you know, mm-hmm. FCS. Uh, so, you know, there, he's been talked about highly as well. So if there is supplemental, he's going to fall, you know, a lot more. But if we're looking at just a freshman draft on there as well, I probably would take him probably the third round. I think he could probably drop to the fourth. I definitely would take him over a guy like Terrence Gibbs, who's had that – that nasty ACL injury that we talked mm-hmm. about a few episodes ago. Georgia Southern's great because he literally will be the offense of Georgia Southern, but from what people are reporting that he is quite a step slower. He's only like maybe 60% of what he used to be before, you know, he had all those offers from Georgia and Alabama before the injury. Now Georgia Southern's going to take the risk on him. Right. But I much rather have Justin Williams in a, in a hypo system. At least he's going to get some opportunity. And the good thing is he's going to get looked at because it's the SEC and the power of five. So mm-hmm. if anything, at least the NFL is going to look at him. And this is the same pedigree as such as an Alvin Kamara. So they're going to look at Tennessee because they have known production that's come out of this university. So I think you could take him third, maybe third, late third, early fourth. If it's just freshman, if it's supplemental, I think you could wait. I think eighth, ninth round it would be a nice, sweet landing mm-hmm. spot there. Uh, I, I'm I would probably reach. I'm probably sure you'd probably reach for maybe like a late seventh or something like that yeah. for the supplemental just to make sure you secure him and have him in the bag. Right. But that's kind of where I'm kind of leaning at is uh, kind of just look for the name. But it, if it's just freshman, you're going to probably have to make sure you catch him in a third or try to get him before he makes the elbow into the fourth round, basically. So mm. that's kind of where we're at. Any other last things on Justin Williams before we're on to the next guy, man? No, I think we handled it pretty good. I mean, I love this kid. So I, I hope I hope he gets that big role in your one. Me too, man. We're hoping for the best for Justin Williams. Stay healthy, Justin. We mm-hmm. hope you do well, buddy. All right, let's talk about some wide receivers before we move into the Big Fish Small Pond. Let's talk about DJ Allen. So he, uh, Corey was able to catch me. I had uh, some stats that was from last week. And <laughs> Corey corrected me, which is great. So I'm glad he helped me out here. But DJ Allen is a four-star prospect, a 24-7 sports grade of 0. 0.9085. Um, he is 5'11 and 190 pounds. I believe he's well over that at this point. Um, 38th overall wide receiver in the 22 class. Um, so we had some... Right up here from our good buddy, Matthew Broom, who was on the show here at one point as well, our big Ohio State guy here. But he has some nice things to say about DJ Allen. So he's like, when you look up a Swiss Army knife in the dictionary, you'll find a picture of DJ Allen, which I thought Mm -hmm. was a nice little segue to start into it. When I think Swiss Army knife, I think of Debo. I think mm-hmm. guys that can really got to get it down on this. Uh, DJ Allen, if he has any type of that type of tangible, that's interesting, especially in a TCU, and especially with Sonny Dykes, and we'll talk about that, right? So Allen played all over the field for high school team. He logged in uh, uh, defensive back, running back, wide receiver, and even quarterback in his senior year. So not only can the man catch, run, he can throw. 
So basically, he's looking at a guy that could be a nasty weapon to go along with as well. So we're not talking about a couple throws. He had 150 passing attempts in his senior season. So I don't know if his high school just needed him or what was going on, but I think that's got to be the case. Yeah, I, I think don't know. the QB might have went down. That's what I'm thinking. But yeah, uh, maybe something like that. Still impressive, right? So yeah, he had an uh, ugly touchdown to, re- to interception ratio, though. three touchdowns to seven yeah. interceptions. I don't think anybody's going to be asking him to throw the ball very much. At no, the next, but the at great the thing line. is, right? Yeah, but the good thing. Is is being a wide receiver, understanding the quarterback role, mm-hmm. and also understanding. And we've had, you know, where was these guys have played the Iron Man role, the defensive back. So now you know your opposition, but you also know the routes that the quarterback is actually looking for, right? Mm-hmm. So this gives DJ Allen a lot of this already head, you know, uh, mindset going into a university, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so for a size, Allen is one of the best contested catch players, and I'm sure you'll talk about this and what you see and when you wrote up in the Debbie Guide. Uh, but his ability to go up and get a ball, uh, from what Matthew said, is absolutely incredible. He displays great body control, which is kind of what we want to see a guy that can track it. Uh, I think there was a, one we saw in the Oregon wide receiver where he just missed it completely, which I think he could have adjusted and caught the ball. Uh, what I forget his name, he was a freshman last year, but anyway, uh, DJ Allen's not going to have this issue. I think he'll be able to track the ball down, be able to find it up in open space, uh, adjust and get the and bring it down, basically go on with it. So due to him playing so many positions, he's a bit raw as a receiver, but that doesn't stop him from being, you know, a highly prospect. He'll likely need to continue to develop nuances, but who better than Sonny Dykes and you know in that type of system, right? So he is headed to TCU, which is a great landing spot. That he did say that you know, new head coach Sonny Dykes has the shown the ability to fe- feature multiple receivers. Um, which is great because Quentin Johnson is locked wide receiver one. He's an absolute stud. Uh, most of us have him in at least probably the top 15 wide receivers in CFF this year. Uh, I'm sure had Debbie stand out. I'm sure Quentin Johnson's being looked at very heavily as well. Yeah, top 10. Kid, yeah, he's 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 a beast. Uh, but guys like Darius Davis, who's a senior year, he's a role player. Quincy Brown's shown some some stuff in camp from what I hear. So I mean he might be a competition to DJ Allen. And then Blair Conright, who's really just a redshirt junior, he's he's kind of there to be some depth and stuff like that and be a good role player, maybe some special teams and stuff like that. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, he did clock. I don't know if I was able to get his uh, stuff, but uh, he did say that he got it 20.5 miles per hour. So I think that's good. It's above the 20. We didn't get the Newtons just yet, but for his height and his speed and stuff like that, I'd have to say he'd probably be over the 7,000 Newton range, pretty easily kind of up there with Henderson and uh, and Miller. So, Corey, from your perspective in a Debbie thing and with your write-up, what's, what did you see of DJ Allen and why is he one of your favorite wide receivers here coming out of the 22 class? Yeah, you know, and I was surprised to see kind of, especially considering how how uh, how high a lot of us are on him. You know, that two four seven had him fairly low. I mean, I think yeah. they were actually a little bit higher on him than than consensus, where he ended up at at, at thirty eight. But I think yeah. he was still in the twenties for two four seven. I think he was outside the top twenty five receivers. So this is a pretty mm-hmm. uh, like a good ranking, but but mm-hmm. I expected a little bit more, I guess, after looking at the tape. But I guess when you look at his, his high school career, it, it's kind of like, it, it's unique, right? Where he kind of was like playing a, a full-time wide receiver role in, in, during his junior year. Um, and then, like we said, switched to the, to the quarterback, but then he was a running back pretty much as well, playing that wildcat quarterback where he rushed for over a thousand yards and 10 touchdowns. So he brings that extra versatility now where he's played multiple positions and, and could be a guy who could be like a Debo Samuel that everybody loves right now. Um, that could take carries out of the backfield. That could be that, that, that versatile type of guy for somebody. Um, he has the good size for a freshman as well. Um, could theoretically uh, get over that two Oh five mark and become that, that stout build mm-hmm. that, that Debo Samuel build, that DJ Moore build that, that, exactly. that build that a lot of guys are really liking on the NFL level right now. Um, talked about his speed, uh, the 20.4. I think it's evident. I think he's, uh, I would say he's qu- more quick than fast. I guess, or, or more, more than a top gear. He didn't pull away as much as I, as I thought when I, we know when I, when we first come in reading all these things, like I was expecting somebody who might be a burner, but when I, when I went and watched the tape, I, I, I don't think he pulled away as much as I would have liked to see, but I still found him quick. Um, I agree with a lot of what Matt said here too. The contested uh, catches, um, the adjustments, the hands, very good stuff. Um, but also like Matt said here too, there is kind of that skepticism about like, is he, is he refined enough in any one area? Is he, is he refined enough as a receiver? He, I mean, he only had 12 receptions in his senior year as well. They really took that out of his, uh, out of, uh, um, out of the playbook for him in a sense. Um, so uh, with, with the added role of being a quarterback and rushing and everything like that. So 
he's going to be raw coming in. And uh, I really wonder if we could see anything in, in, in the first year, you know, uh, landing at TCU might have scared some people off, but like you said, they bring in so many dykes uh, this year. I there's a lot, yeah. yeah there, there's a lot to be optimistic about, you know, routinely in the top 15 in points per game. Uh, his passing offense has been a big part of that. His quarterbacks routinely throwing over 3,500 yards. Um, you know, quarterbacks under his name, Jared Goff was under him as well. Worked him into a, into a first round pick. Um, I know Dugan isn't the greatest. Um, yeah, not a fan. Uh, you're not a big fan. No, uh, yeah. Duggan. No, I like no. Chandler Morris a little bit more. So I'm hoping yeah, Morris wins out. Getting, yeah. And he's, but we'll he's see, been getting right? some buzz too. So, yeah. uh, I mean, we'll see who ends up winning there. Um, I have some that, speculation uh, out there, at least, at least transfer. in my chat. Yeah. Yeah. At least, at least in some chat groups and stuff that some people have it, the SMU guys with Mordecai and Preston Stone. Oh, if one I of them end up, end up losing and going over there, right? I'm a big Preston Stone guy too. So I'd love Me to too. see that. And Mordecai was really good last year too. I mean, yeah, he, he probably operate that offense just fine too. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, he does incorporate multiple receivers. Uh, last year, I think he had three wide receivers over 600 yards. Um, Typically over his career, he's at two over 800 for most of the time in his more recent years as head coach. Um, I did look back. I got, I kind of went back further and further and further just to see if he had really utilized anybody like a Debo Samuel or like a versatile role, somebody who took carries and somebody took catches. I really couldn't find anybody. There wasn't somebody who had a massive amount of carries and catches or anything like that. So uh, I'm excited to see what maybe he could cook up for, for some for somebody like DJ, um, because there really hasn't been a president there to see what how he's going to use him. Maybe he's just going to be a full time wide receiver and he won't cook up fun plays for him. Then that would kind of suck. But <laughs> I, I, I hope yeah. that he does do something. Um, I do think that we could probably be waiting till 2023 to really see him come out. I know that a lot of these guys aren't f- fabulous or whatever. Um, but the, but they do seem like guys who who could probably con- contribute like Darius Davis, uh, Quinn Johnson is obviously going to be a rock star this year, um, and I, I that's why a lot of people are are really high on him this year because people are are constantly saying they don't realize what the change with Tony Dykes and what he's going to bring to this team as long as as long as the quarterback can get him the ball that that's probably the that's biggest thing matters. because uh, you know Dugan was constantly under throwing him con- uh, last year and him having to adjust the ball so if they can just get somebody to, to deliver in the ball he's gonna have a monster year and he deserves to be ranked as highly as he's gonna be so um you know, a, a lot of guys leave next year though. I like like Darius exactly. Davis is going to leave. Um, Tay Barber Johnson's who's going to draft. Yeah. yeah, Tay Barber is going to be a guy who's probably going to leave. He's been pretty productive for them over the last couple of years. Uh, Darius Davis is going to be gone. So um, I'm sure Dykes is going to figure out interesting ways to incorporate him. This is a guy maybe you could work up a trick play to. He could you know throw a pass down the field if you wanted to. You know, give him the toss outside and look for an option. If not, run the ball. Whatever. He might he might be that kind of guy. But I still think we're probably a year away on this guy. Yeah. I do get um, – and a guy that I really love, and that's no secret because he's in my first episode, but Matthew Golden out of Houston. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely a wide receiver too this year, but after when Nathaniel Dell eventually just goes to the NFL because Dell's an absolute monster, yeah. uh, especially in a Holgerson offense, like Matthew Golden's just going to skyrocket to wide receiver one. Houston's moving into a P5 situation, so now Golden's mm-hmm. going to get a lot more eyes on him, right? I, I like – that's the kind of DJ Allen I feel, but I feel like he's more – he, he's raw, but the good thing about that is that you can mold him to what you want, but he's got so many tricks in the bag that he can do now, yeah. especially if they want to do like a, I don't know, I don't think a Statue of Liberty thing would happen, but you never know where you can pass it to him and at least can get the ball down to maybe, uh, I would love to see Stone or Mordecai here. This is That's ultimately what we're hoping, but at least if Chandler Morris can win out, then I'm going to be a lot happier, basically. This is, so basically, yeah. just anybody but Doug, and no offense, <laughs> Doug, and if you're listening, I doubt you do, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I, I definitely feel like a wide receiver two type vibe. I, the, other than Darius Davis, like there's there's really not a lot of guys that can really stop him. I mean Johnson's the clear stud. He's he's the wide receiver one. There's no doubting that whatsoever. But DJ Allen can definitely come in here and, and make a difference. Um, and the good thing we see is even in raw talent, like DK Metcalf, he really didn't have a route tree until he went to Seattle. It meant Longo had him just run the way he wanted to. So, so Sonny could literally just be like, I need you to go and make it over here to this point. Yeah. And we'll just get the ball to you. Or I think he just literally just run the sweeps out the backfield. That's the great part about DJ Allen is that mm-hmm. sky's the limit with this guy. And though he, you know, he wasn't ranked so crazy out of recruiting. I think his college tape is really going to kind of transcend Allen into being more of a higher four star than what he, you know, more than what we kind of saw already in tape, but now we'll see it in college form. So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, Debbie, where are you where are we where are we thinking about taking him? And uh as far as round wise, uh I definitely would take him C to C. That's no that's a no brainer, but yeah. How about Debbie, man? What what are you thinking? 
So where do I have him ranked right now? He's, you know, I'm still settling down on the wide receivers. He's constantly moving, and now we're losing Randall, so that's going to yeah. go. Well, I'm not losing him, actually, in Debbie. I'm still going to have him pretty up. Yeah, yeah. Just, just maybe just a little bit. But um, I think he's going to be a top 10 guy for me at okay. the end of the day. Um, so you're probably looking at about third round, I'd say, is yeah. probably your shot to take him. Um, I don't know if he's going to creep into that second round. The last one I did, he did go at 2.9. So he is starting to creep up. There's buzz out there. Hmm. It's that C2C bump. I mean, I, I think... Bump. Yeah, I think Matthew even, uh, or Matt, I think his name, yeah, Matthew or Matt Bruning. I'm not sure if his actual name is yeah, Matthew. He did the write up on this one. Yeah. Yeah. He did the write up on this one. And, and in his quick pick, they had a little thing at the bottom. And he pretty much said, you know, I expect Allen to be a first round pick in, in 2025. So wow. a first round NFL draft pick in 2025. So wow. I, I mean, with words like that, you're already going to get uh, a lot bold. of climbing because I'm surprised yeah. to see him in the second round already for given the recruiting and everything mm-hmm. like that. And, and, uh, People, people who aren't as familiar being a little bit down on TCU as a program yeah. with, with wide receivers and production and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I'm pulling the trigger in 209. Um, nah, I think that's a little too rich for me. Yeah, that's a little bit too high for me. Uh, late third, I'd probably look more around there. Um, I'm still probably going to take a guy like Isaiah Bond over him. I know oh, that I, I like I, Bond. Um, yeah, I mean, a big time athlete going to Alabama. So I'm still really like him. Um, a guy like, uh, Talon Chitron, Talon Chitron. I, can't, I don't know how to say his name. I really like him too. So he's going to kind of be in that similar area for me. Um, uh, gotcha. But yeah, so so yeah, somewhere around that area, probably late third yeah, or early fourth. The thing about this is like CFF, you might actually see some pretty decent protection, probably a little bit out of year one. I'm not saying a whole lot, but he could essentially go to wide receiver too. If anything, he's going to have some wide receiver three, wide receiver three, but have some wide receiver two days. So I mean, like you're going to have to probably take him and, I, like I said, this is without supplemental. If it's supplemental, you could probably wait on him a few more rounds. But we're looking at probably a third rounder here with DJ Allen, kind of in the same boat here. It's funny how Devi and uh, C2C kind of all of a sudden it starts merging a little bit into yeah, the CFF yeah. stuff. But this is a guy that can't produce it. If anything, especially in CFF Dynasty, to get him in the third round and hold on to him and then watch him, you know, destroy in Sonny Dyke's offense there, you know, even in year two. Heck yeah, man. I would take that in a heartbeat. So uh, definitely I would say round three. I don't know if I'd go round two, but uh, if if he starts trending that way, it is what it is. If you like if you like a good wide receiver at a TCU and a Sunny Ducks offense, this is your guy, right? Yeah. Uh, but before we move on, I just want to say that I did use uh, some of the stuff that you can get for the freshman and supplemental guide. I don't do it a lot, uh, but I wanted to kind of give you guys an example of what these write-ups are like and that it's just different from what you see out of other guides just because everyone has their personal type take and stuff like that, so it's more personalized. So I want you guys to kind of see you know, the stuff that me and Corey were kind of reading here and kind of see what you could get out of the Debbie guide, the CFF guide, and now the freshman guide that's already out. So can't do this often. Otherwise, I think Austin would probably, you know, ask me from the team from giving out, you know, a lot of the, you know, a it's lot of the stuff. stuff. But, yeah, but at the same time, I do want, you know, I still feel like you guys are deserving of like at least getting to see it from, you know, at least the standpoint, whether you're doing it on YouTube or listening in and stuff like that. But this is the kind of stuff that you can kind of look forward to. So I wanted to guys give you a little, you know, something extra this week and something different. And I was like, Corey's the guy to kind of do it. And since he's writing on the Debbie guide, he can kind of bring his own type of take. So this is the stuff you can expect from the team. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, but we are going to move into the next segment. Are you ready, Mr. Corey? Let's do it. All right, man. This is the big fish, small pond. And we have the freshman uh, going to Louisiana Tech. He is a three-star athlete. It is D. Anthony Gatson, uh, 24-7 sports grade of 0.8783. He is 5'10", 200 pounds. I believe he is at 205 at this point, maybe. Uh, the thing is, you can't really get a lot of Louisiana Tech when it comes to news. It's uh, You have to dig real deep or just hope yeah. that someone goes to a spring uh, practice and just finds, right? Uh, he is the 43rd overall, so he is in the top 50 of the, you know, the running back class here. I put QB. That was a mistake. I meant running back. Uh, yeah. But he is uh, an unverified size, so we have to find out in camp. So we're just hoping that someone drops some knowledge for us and goes from there. But he has adequate height and a sturdy build. He's not the proverbial big back, but he is assembled. Uh, you know, he's stoutly assembled with a run to match. He runs hard despite uh, upright gait. For those that don't know, gait means how you stand 
or how you pose when you're running. So he does have a higher frame, and that's concerning to some scouts because they don't. It's a fumble situation, like they don't want it too high where they can smack it out type situation. However, uh, he does lower his pad level as he gains speed. So it's almost like he becomes the bowling ball for those that are watching on YouTube. Is he kind of you know goes down as he progresses to go along with it, which I think is good. He flashes a pretty nasty stiff arm, which is good. I've seen Omario Hampton in person who's going to Carolina this year. So if you could hit him with a stiff arm, then that's perfect. I like a guy that can just break contact and actually looks for contact, and that's something that D'Anthony Gatson is doing real. So he does, he, re, he redirects well uh, without much of going down speed, so he can redirect pretty quick. So he does have the shiftiness that we're kind of looking for as well. Uh, and so it helps him elude some of the tacklers and stuff like that. So we have a smaller bowling ball, and we have some elusiveness. So this is kind of the tangibles that we're looking at, right? Uh, so great production through his junior year, consecutive 1,800-yard season and 4,000 total yards. He got 11 uh, you know, yards per carry, which is fantastic in his first three years. Uh, he does lack some athleticism, uh, any form other than on field. So, I mean, at least on the field he's good, but if you're trying – the combine, I don't know if the guy would do so hot uh, currently right now. He might need some time in college to, you know, make maybe have some good combine number set situation, right? But he can open up, uh, you know, and increase the long speed. So as long as he's getting out to the second level, it's going to be hard to catch the kid, right? So at least he's got that type of speed and tangible. So he needs to get uh, acclimated. They said that he's able to be a P5 caliber, but yet he chose a G5. So I don't know if that's a situation of – because he got offers from, like, Texas and Florida. There's a few other ones that yeah, really – I was surprised look at, at the, that offers he got, actually. When I was yeah. At yeah. He got some good offers. Michigan, uh, USC, yeah. ISU, exactly. Texas. Yeah, he had a lot of good offers. Oh, man, if he went to Iowa State, I, I kind of like him a little bit better than Brock, but it's only because of the, the you yeah. know, this his build. You know what I'm saying? He looks like a guy that would be like a Montgomery, Brees Hall situation more than, say, uh, a Jareel Brock. But, you know. We have what to see. At least Iowa State is known to have really great running back schemes. So, but yeah. Louis isn't a tech in the past. And, you know, this is where I have to win you over a little bit. Louis isn't a tech isn't really known for their, their RBU because there is no RBU at Louisiana Tech, right? <laughs> but because the guy has been overall MVP as a junior, uh, he's won national, you know, your state championships there. He did play in Texas. And Texas has, and this is Newton High School, and there's been a lot of great recruits that come out of Newton. So, uh, he comes from a, you know, illustrious, good, uh, you know, uh, high school. So, I mean, he plays good competition in the state of Texas. You can't get better than that, right? So he is a pretty high thir- uh, three-star, but I don't know if uh, him going down to Louisiana Tech kind of hurt his chances a little bit or anything like that. However, the only guy I really see, and we'll look at the depth chart here, is uh, Keon Henry Brooks, who came from Vanderbilt. I think that would probably mm-hmm. be the one guy that I would see as maybe the competition for RB1. But a guy like Greg Garner, who's a senior transfer, he's really – role player change of bay, pace harlan dixon uh has been there already for a year and hasn't even seen the field so i don't know if that's a uh he has to you know win in and camp and see or if he's another role player it's yet to be determined harlan dixon so he's he's a question mark but the anthony gatson's got the tangibles to definitely at least see the field the, the thing is is louisiana tech and they had kindle last year and he went down with injury then they had the backup quarterback. Now I'm not even sure who's going to win this QB battle. That's something that hopefully someone will get news out of. But Smoke Harris is still there, the wide receiver. He's used a lot um, as a, a gadget guy, so he does catch a lot of bubbles. He does the sweeps. Smoke Harris lives up to the first name of Smoke because he he lays out the smoke, man. He, he, he gets it and goes. The kid's got a second gear, which is great. However, he's not getting a lot of looks because he is at Louisiana Tech. So that's something that we do worry about with Gatson. Um you know, I know we're looking at this as CFF uh, and not so much Debbie in this perspective, but Louis and a take, man. I mean, like opportunity, right? And a high yep. three star and a guy that's a bowling ball and can uh, elude tackles. This is Conference USA. So uh, just like we've had in other episodes, Conference USA does a little bit of tackling. They got some guys defensively that comes <laughs> out, but not a whole lot, right? Maybe like a guy or two from Western Kentucky, maybe a guy out of Marshall, maybe a guy out of Charlotte or something like that. But most of them don't play defense like SEC which he had the opportunity to go as a P5. So being in a G5, now he has opportunity to really shine, right? And in CFF, that's what you're looking for, a guy that knows how to how to break the tackles, knows how to just get downfield. So he is a candidate looking at someone that, uh, that can make some difference in year one. But uh, I know you were talking about the head coach before we hit the record, so is that your main, I'd say, objective as far as uh, Gatson coming in here in year one? 
No, I mean, I, I'm going to be straight up honest with you. When you told me this sure. guy's name, I never even heard about him ever a day in my life. Oh, okay, so that's the biggest <laughs> ball for you. So that's I love, what I'm uh, saying for. I, I, yeah, that's that's great. I love I love when I can get some new guys to look at and and guys that that, that should be on my radar, anyways. But yeah, I mean, um, I was just looking back at other things. I'm trying to find, you know, I in in college, you know, a lot of the time in the NFL, we say, oh, the, forget the team talent if, if you love the talent take the talent in college sometimes it's different it, yes, you, you look at that you look at that scheme and you look at like mm-hmm. what they've been able to produce uh the talent level is not as high as in the nfl so these guys even at less adequate athleticism or less or, or a little bit not as good as a guy who was in front of him if he's going to hop into a certain role he might be as productive as that last guy so so i like to look back at, at stuff like that there wasn't a whole bunch i found about tony crumble um besides you know yeah, disciple of Mike Leach, guy who came from a guy who had a really good start to his head coaching career, to his offensive career with uh, TCU. Um, then you know it's like they kind of got figured out, like any like a lot of Mike Leach's offense when they refused yes. to change anything. Yeah, so he kind of got figured out there. Um, was he with did. Texas Tech last year, and they kind of were just like a mess as well. So yeah. um, there wasn't a lot to to kind of look back in there, but but I did like some of the things I saw from from his profile. Anyways, we talked about the offers he already had, so he was already you know being thought of pretty highly in this recruitment cycle. Um, I did get to watching his tape a little bit too, you know, just just brief looks. He did kind of play in that, in that wing T offense in high school with the two backs mm-hmm. behind him, uh, a lot of counters, a lot of outside running. Um, so and uh, they did also say that he played. Uh, was it? Yeah, did he play in a lower level? Is that did I say that right? Yeah, face small school competition. Yeah, so he did it's play in a lower yeah. level. Yeah. yeah, he did play in a relatively low level as competition as well there. So there could be a little bit of a transition um, with him coming from that type of offense if they're going to ask for him to play a more traditional role. Um, yeah, he was a guy I found who played bigger than his size. If his size is 5'10", 200, um, he played a lot bigger than it. He was going to, you know, plow through tacklers, bounce off contact. Uh, he had some nasty blocks too, because in that wing yeah. T offense, sometimes you end up being the lead blocker when you're swinging around or whatever. Mm-hmm. And he laid out some nasty blocks on that tape. He, he made yeah. sure to highlight them. In, in some and if you block, highlights. you stay on the field. And that's exactly. Another, you know? so, so that's always good. Yeah, he showed some nice vision. Um, I didn't really find, I mean, you they kind of said it in the write-up anyways, but I didn't really find that he had the, the high-end finishing gear. There was, you know, getting caught from behind. Wasn't a, an overall explosive guy. Had a little bit of wiggle to him. Was a guy who could kind of make some moves in the open field, but wasn't a guy who, who was bursting down the sideline or anything like that. So so there will be some some athleticism concerns there with him. But he's a guy, you know, you, you're kind of putting on my radar here, and a guy that I'm, I'm probably going to uh, – to, to keep my eye on at least, you know, at least for right. CFF and stuff like that too. Like you yeah. said, there's not a lot here on, on yeah. the depth chart. CFF, uh, you're not taking him in a freshman draft, but he, he's a guy that you, you know, you definitely circle, you put the gold star on and you like, Hey, yeah. if I see this kid on waivers and I'm starting to see a, you know, a consistent production and touches, that's yeah. when you want to start grabbing them and get them or, at low or value before these, it blows these, up. These, yeah, or these C2C drafts that go to round 45, and you're trying to scrape exactly. together any piece of information you can to, oh, to choose who you're going to draft. Heck in yeah. That, right, yeah, <laughs> in that round 45. So, I mean, he's yeah. definitely getting drafted in leagues like that. So, And, I mean, if he does get the good job, I mean, I'm, I was hoping you could sell me a little bit more on this on this situation overall. I can't, other than opportunity. It's other than opportunity, though. There's yeah, not much competition I, other than Henry yeah. Brooks. That's all I can really give you, man. Yeah, because I didn't love everything they looked at from, you know, their their offenses statistics everything like that like they're not a very potent offense they weren't you know they don't have a lot going on a lot of changeover as well so we're gonna mm-hmm. see if this guy can maybe break out through this group so but but yeah i appreciate yeah. you putting him on my radar anyways and we'll, we'll see Absolutely. what happens and this was gabe brooks he did the uh report uh, here for 24 7 sports he did think he was going to be a p5 guy so i mean that's got to say mm-hmm. something that the scouts thought he could play at right, a, right. you know even a bigger tier uh if the guy blows up you never know he could you know want to pull, you know, one of these wide receiver running back guys was like, Hey man, I proved it at G five trying to move to P five. Maybe he transfers somewhere else, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I mean, it's not, depends. it's not unlike, um, what's his name? Um, who just had the freaking injury of uh, McGaskill who ended up going yeah, to, to G five. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know they're joining, uh, the big 12 right away anyways, but, um, yeah, I mean, rest poor McGaskill. I mean, I was so looking forward to watching. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he was gonna be so good in redraft this year too, man. I, yeah, I don't have I him in his dynasty, but he would have been great redraft pickup. And man. he's one I'm, of the guys that I that as Devi guy, I do have in my top twenty as a G five running back. Yeah. So that speaks volumes to somebody. But I mean, he showed out a lot in freshman year as well, which is what you kind of like to see. But yeah, if Newton can make, I mean, uh, not Newton. I looked at his jersey and I said Newton. Yeah. If the Anthony Gadsden can make can make you know some moves and, and have a nice freshman season then you know maybe you can hop on the radar for debbie too yeah absolutely all right well we're going to remove that 
So I do want to thank Corey for hopping on. It has been a pleasure, my man. Uh, before we get gone for the day, uh, is there anything that you want to plug or you know anything that's coming up? I know you got the Debbie guy if you want to speak a little bit more on that, but if you got any other cool projects or anything like that you want to let the listeners and the viewers know? Uh, I'll tell you what, I am a full-time dad at the moment. <laughs> I don't, right. I, I'm grinding on this Debbie guide right now because, um, kind of have a late, ha, had a little bit of a late start to it and we really want to hit these deadlines and, and, uh, get this stuff out for you guys. So I've been really grinding on that. Um, I, I, over at the Debbie dashboard with uh, my great friend, Brandon Lejeune, who also has a lot of Debbie, Debbie content at Debbie deep dive. If you want to check them out, yeah, we're going to be probably sure. doing a few shows soon. Uh, maybe just hitting some sleepers, hitting some, some buys in the off season, hitting some sells in the off season, stuff like that. Purely Debbie related. We're Devi guys at heart. I'm a Devi guy at heart. So that's really what you're going to end up finding for me. Um, other than that, you know, I'm, I'm a writer. I just, uh, I like to write. It's something that I, that I find the time to do with a child. <laughs> I'm yeah. able to just kind of jot some things down here and there, you know, yeah. it, it, I find it hard to be live and, and do pods all the time, but um uh, yeah, so I did just release some, an article on Campus Canton highlighting some mid-round Debbie prospects if you want to go over there and check it out. Um, and I'll be continuing to write stuff. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, I'm all around. I'm all over the place. I, I try to fit in wherever I can. I love coming on a pod and, and talking and getting some opinions from guys like yourself. So I appreciate that. And, you know, I'm glad that we can get you on some more podcasts and uh, maybe it'll just spark the juices. And eventually, you know, as the kids get older, maybe it could be a full time podcast. Or stuff down the road. You never know. Right. That's the great <laughs> part. Uh, once again, I, you know, campus, the Please go check that out, guys. Uh, like I said, articles, which you can find Corey at uh, our guy, Nate Marquise over in the CFF. Uh, Nate, he dropped one. We're starting a series called RBU where we uh, a lot of us like certain teams that have like really good running back standouts and stuff like that. So he's he's big on Oklahoma. So he's shed a light on the Javante Barnes versus Gavin Solchuk, which is another good one that we've talked about in the past. Uh, I think, you know, Jared's going to be doing Georgia coming uh me being the north carolina guy having like a javante williams and michael carter and stuff like that is coming out of running backs you know the next trend to see these new guys we're going to start giving you that type of situation uh another cool announcement uh i will be going to the unc spring game so i'll be there this coming saturday nice. of course uh i have a interview coming up with our uh, great friend uh, don callahan at inside carolina 24 7 sports so we'll be talking some of the recruits from this year and maybe some to look at maybe next year as well so kind of keep in lock for there and then we do have another interview lined up with Corey from Pac Pride and 24 7 Sports with NC State. So we're going to have him on as well and talk about uh, these new recruits. They just signed uh, one of my good friends, Javante Vereen. He's a tight end four star guy coming out of Havelock High School, who's right down the street from me. So now NC State's got a decent tight end now that we haven't seen in a mm -hmm. hot minute. Maybe not Jalen Samuels like we liked back then, but uh, definitely, mm -hmm. definitely a guy that they can use in the offense. And with Devin Leary uh, on top of his game here recently, that's a that's a good thing to have. Um, but I do guys want to thank you for coming on and listening and watching as well. If you can, uh, just request, if you can just drop like a five-star review, that would be great. I'm on Spotify, Amazon, all the major platforms. You can do that for me. It helps get the views up. I think we're in the top 200 of fantasy sports right now, which is fantastic. So if you can move up a little higher, that'd be great. Um, and also if you're on YouTube, please leave a comment down below. Uh, me and Corey will probably take a look at this episode. So if you guys have questions or just comments and stuff like that, we'll be glad to kind of get some comments on there as well. So, but thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Uh, we hope to see you guys next week. Be good to each other and peace.